uh, interesting and a little different. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a supported session by uh, AstraZeneca. And we're going to have some discussion here with the panelists. There will be some walking on the stage between this podium and, and the panelists when they come and express their thoughts as well. All the panelists are contracted for this session. Now, why are we discussing this? Because we do understand that diabetes is a big global problem. Uh, in fact, a larger local problem and the number of people with diabetes has constantly been increasing. If you see what numbers were there in 2000, uh, at 171, the projected for 2030 was 366 million and it doesn't hold good. Already by 2019, the numbers that we saw was 463 globally, 77 million in India and then the projection has had to change. And I'm pretty certain by the time we reach 2030, we would have gone beyond those projections. So the, the problem is huge. Now, when we talk about various complications, the kidney complications do occur early in type 2 diabetes, highlighting the need for early management of kidney risk. If you look at the prevalence of microvascular complications at the time of type 2 diabetes diagnosis itself, we are aware that a certain percentage of patients will have uh, retinopathy and you are seeing the divide between the newly diagnosed in primary care setting. Uh, versus those who are actually screened for the same. You look at some amount of neuropathy and 48% already at diagnosis. And then you look at presence of microalbuminuria and anywhere between 17 to 26% will have this problem at the time of type 2 diabetes diagnosis. The first comorbidity identified in cardiovascular free patients with type 2 diabetes and you see the percentages for different ones. So CKD at 36% as compared to stroke at 16, MI 14, peripheral artery disease at 10 and heart failure at 24. So largely implying that by the time we diagnose patients, a significant percentage already have comorbidities and some complications. So we all of course need to evolve and change our thought process from waiting for years to, to go by and then start thinking about complications as we are well aware that complications are there and beginning and will only worsen unless our approach changes from glucose-centric to, to vascular-renal protective uh, approach. We talk specifically about CKD in India. There is high prevalence and of course delayed diagnosis. 17.2% prevalence in the adult population. More than 2 lakh patients on dialysis and of course 5,000 dialysis centers across India. Um, a lot of a lot of diagnosis happens at the late stage and that continues to be a problem in our population and you also have the division by the different stages of ckd um, where we see how each stage is divided in the total ckd population so we move to our case which is how the panelists will be helping us um, for this gentleman who's 54 years old type 2 diabetes for last five years has dyslipidemia over six years, hypertension for last six years, has background diabetic retinopathy. Current treatment, metformin 500 twice a day, cetagliptin 100 OD, ramipril, uh, along with hydrochlorothiazide and rosuvastatin. Blood pressure is at 135 AT, BMI of 30, HbA1c 7.4, eGFR at 56 milliliters per minute, a USCR of 88 Total cholesterol 180, LDL at 110, HDL 40, fasting triglycerides at 120. So pretty much again a, a, a regular case that we will end up seeing in our clinics um, with multiple comorbidities, not at control, eGFR a little on the lower side. So let me repeat the status of this patient, A1C 7.4, patient has multiple risk factors. Yeah, thank you for the mic there. eGFR 56, USCR 88. What would be the treatment approach? And what we're going to do is, for this patient, how do we help this patient? We'll be taking the help of our expert panelists. Um, so There will be a holistic management approach, and, and that's where all the three specialists would come in. Let me start by asking Dr. Shaila Jakale the approach for the metabolic correction, both in terms of HbA1c reduction, and what would you want to do for this individual's weight with a BMI of 30? Over yes. to Dr. Kale. Yes. Thank you, Manoj. And um, I think this is a gentleman who walks in in the clinic, looks very fit and fine. 
blood pressure good, A1C is fantastic, 7.4. Uh, but when you look into his clinical characteristics and the report, then you, cal you see that he belongs to ASCVD, no, but high risk. That's what we were discussing in last session. That once you say ASCVD, no, patient can be in big spectrum, low to the highest. And he looks blood pressure, albuminuria, obesity, high BMI. And of course, uh, microalbumin and LDL is not under control. In spite of 20 mg of rosuvastatin, LDL is 110, which is a big uh, we, we need to look at. So aggressive treatment is required. And uh, very important part here is the family history of cardiovascular disease is crucial because it doesn't take into all risk engines, but it decides the fate. And so though we say one day he gets an infarct and he goes to the ACVD, yes. So treatment has to be aggressive. I was a part of a um, paper with ABD Tehrani about, uh, I, we don't like to call it as a primary prevention because it's a tricky name, but you can divide in the low risk, how all the HGLT2 inhibitors are most beneficial. Though this individual you have mentioned microalbuminuria, I think it's more of a cardiovascular risk he will face. So treatment, of course, approach we will discuss, but first thing is very aggressive cardiovascular risk Assessment is required, mm -hmm. which lacks in diabetes clinics, which mm -hmm. I feel, I think you, you will agree. So we need to aggressively assess his risk because he goes to the higher spectrum of risk. HGLT2 inhibitor, first choice because of the obesity and his risk profile, no doubt. As we just heard well, that we can combine it with GLP-1 analog if we want for the better weight reduction and the better weight effects. What this slide is actually showing in 2023 if there is a patient with overt proteinuria, a type 2 diabetes person, no doubt HGLT2 inhibitor are the first drug of choice when you compare it between HGLT2 and GLP-1 analog. Now, there is no question this person can be on dapagliflozine because even though he has microalbuminuria, there are other risk factors which are showing and we have loads of data from DECLARE that in such a kind of ASCVD, no, but high risk individuals, even as a primary prevention, how this drug plus weight loss and A1C should go to 6.5 intensive without having a hypoglycemia. So I think first choice, any HGLT2 inhibitor here will be a good choice. Second, the 2023 ADA standard says that if GFR is below 60 but without albuminuria, now we are going into the category of patients of type 2 diabetes, it can be non-diabetic kidney disease or it can be diabetes, kidney disease without proteinuria. I think he will expand on that. But like all credence, all the excluded patients of polycystic kidneys. We don't know about renal cysts. These are very common patients where they have low GFR, but usually they don't progress like diabetic kidney disease. So such patients with obesity, you can have either choice. That's what the recommendation says, GLP-1 or HGLT-2 inhibitor. That is the difference. But I will still put HGLT-2 inhibitor as a first choice with ease of use and the effect on the weight along with the intensive control. Thank you. So I think most would agree about the hierarchical use of SGLT2 inhibitors for such patients, especially in our country over GLP-1s clearly. So let me take this now to our next uh, um, uh, specialist. What would be the treatment approach at this patient, uh, at this early stage of CKD, Dr. Saxena? Um, you would, would you like to come here or you will you'll speak from there? It's, I, can yeah, speak. Okay, sure. I completely agree with Dr. Kali. So here the scenario is uh, our patient is diabetic with CKD stage 3A with microalbuminuria. The first choice, as she has already told us, SGLT2 inhibitors. But uh, before that, uh, uh, I would like to emphasize uh, management of diabetic nephropathy, which we are doing for the last 30 years. We have a couple of things which we are doing. Uh, few therapies have been established in the last 25 years. One is optimizing the blood pressure with RAS inhibition. And I would say at this stage, still we are not exploiting fully the RAS inhibition, which is an important uh, treatment for controlling protein use. So here in this slide, I would like to emphasize that at one point we have a target of achieving HbA1c, and at the other end we have a target of achieving HbA1c plus optimizing RAS inhibition and other uh, managements like lipid management, use of aspirin, even when we apply all the preventive strategies to slow down the progression of the chronic kidney disease. We don't achieve much slowdown in progression of kidney disease. So 
So at this point of time, we don't have any particular therapy which can really make a difference in slowing the progression of the kidney disease. So if I ask you a question, you mentioned about you know, complete RAS inhibition. For this particular patient, Dr. Saxena, uh, besides the other things that would you do, a uh, patient was in Ramipril 5 milligram. Would you want to step up the dose? What would you like to do on that front? Uh, here I would see the important is blood pressure targets. If we have already achieved with 5 milligrams and proteinuria is already in the microalunuria range, I would say it is good enough. Okay, fair. That HOPE trial showed that 10 mg is beneficial. And, uh, uh, the, the dose uh, is not important. Uh, the important is the optimize. If proteinuria is microalunuria range, our targets solid would be 125. And uh, our target is to bring down from micro, macro to microalunuria. So it's already established. Can you have a quick comment about ACE versus ARB about this proteinuria and diabetic kidney disease? Oh, okay, yeah. So basically, ACE inhibitors were the first to be established after RAIN trial in 1993. So another seven years were with Remipril. Then came these angiotensin receptor blockers in the early 2000s. And a couple of angiotensin receptor blockers came one after other. And whenever a new molecule comes, tell me certain came after all me certain, there was always some difference shown that it is going to be a different from other one. But actually, they are all same. There is no head-to-head -head comparison as such to say that one is superior to other. Even combinations have been tried, but uh, they failed to show mortality benefits, so they were withdrawn. Subsequently, then renin inhibitors also came up. In so altitude trial, it showed in one of the trial, it showed 20% reduction in proteinuria. But even then, it did not lead to a sustained response in the improvement. So overall, I would say, whether you use ACE inhibitors or ARVs. True. I think be. the general approach is type 1 more with ACE, inhibit, uh, ACE inhibitors, type 2 because of affordable ARVs. Uh, that, that seems to be the preference, yeah, at least in, at the early level. Okay, your, your next slide about CVD real and your thoughts on this. So here, um, I would like to show the impact of SGLT2 inhibitors in the real-world scenario. So this is a multinational prospective cohort study where patients uh, using SGLT2 inhibitors and those using other oral glyce uh, hypoglycemic agents were studies and renal outcome parameters were seen. So it was seen that the patients who were on SGLT2 inhibitors had lesser incidence or lesser outcomes in the renal uh, parameters. So SGLT2 inhibitors basically shows a favorable outcome in management of diabetes in terms of renal outcome as compared to non-SGLT uh, oral hypoglycemic agent users. So after this uh, broad-based knowledge and a lot of literature available with the SGLT2 inhibitors and other new therapies coming up in management of chronic kidney disease and diabetes, a holistic approach has been followed. Lifestyle modification has already been discussed. First-line therapy, we still prefer the SGLT2 inhibitors as the first-line therapy, especially when there is micro or macroalnuria, or if a class of patient who has low GFR with normal alnuria. Even then, we don't say that this is inferior. We say it is equivalent to other therapy. So first-line therapy, SGLT2 inhibitors with metformin, and again, emphasizing RAS inhibition to maximum. Then regular assessment is important. We nephrologists, we always uh, keep a watch on the degree of proteinuria. BP control and potassium. And whenever we are not achieving targets, we keep on increasing uh, the remipril. What we find in clinical practice that whenever BP is uncontrolled, so remipril or say, tell me certain 40 milligram is combined with amlodipine. I would say the 40 milligram of amlodipine, uh, 10 milligram uh, or 5 milligram of amlodipine plus uh, 40 milligram of tell me certain would be inferior to 80 milligram of telmisartan. We should uh, maximize the RAS inhibition rather than adding the calcium channel blockers or any other things. If our potassium is allowing and our GFR has not increased more than 15% from the baseline. <coughs> so, third, hmm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. third thing is proteinuria. Many times we do not achieve the proteinuria targets. So we have non-steroidal MRAs. So we should exploit these medications also. And we should not forget that there can be a possibility of coexisting primary glomerular disease in diabetic nephropathy, but and we should not keep on managing diabetic nephropathy, missing such diagnosis. Sure. But very often we see even nephrologists using calcium channel blockers or physicians preferring that because of their efficacy on blood pressure reduction. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about maximizing the RAS inhibition yeah. benefit, mm -hmm. but they are, they are great agents for, for that benefit, but probably not for blood pressure reduction. And that's where very often you have to resolve to other drugs. So your thoughts? 
Yeah. So uh, it all depends on whether you are easily achieving the blood pressure targets or your proteinuria is not under control. So we have to decide accordingly. The control of proteinuria is a priority. Sure. Okay. Uh, so after the, all these uh, information and robust uh, literature available, KDGO has published guidelines. Uh, sorry, can you go behind the previous slide? KDGO guidelines have been published. Sorry. KDGO is basically a kidney di disease initiative global outcome which regularly publishes guidelines which is followed by the nephrologist. So now for the management of type 2 uh, diabetes with chronic kidney disease, besides lifestyle modifications, there are strict guidelines that we should use metformin with SGLT2 inhibitors as the first line therapies. SGLT2 inhibitors have been used up to a GFR of 20 ml per minute, and this information is based on one uh, study, DEPA CKD trial, which was published in NEGM, in which 14.5 uh, uh, to 15 percent patients had GFR less than 30 ml per minute, and this significantly showed the benefit. So we have a cutoff of 20 ml per minute where we can use DEPA gliflozin. Metformin is commonly used. When GFR is less than 45 ml per minute, we reduce by 50%. And when it is less than 30, we usually discontinue it. Yeah. So the question is, which SGLT2 would you use? Uh, this is a difficult question. It's not very easy to say. But uh, the answers are given based on the literature. If you look at all the various uh, trials which have been done with the SGLT2 inhibitors, most of the trials, they have used cardiac endpoints as the primary outcome. Renal outcome has been studied as a secondary outcome. This uh, APA CKD trial and declare TME, they have some components of renal outcome parameters. So if you look at these trials, we have uh, good evidence with the declare TME trials and DEPA CKD trials that uh, DEPA can be preferred over other agents in management of CKD. What would be the prevention benefits from the CKD perspective in DECLARE? Next slide. Yeah, so when we look at this DECLARE trial, when we compare it with other trials, baseline characteristic, the eGFR in DECLARE trial is 85.2. So we have a well-preserved GFR to start with in our study population in DECLARE trial. So whatever is going to happen, we can uh, study it well. So eGFR, baseline eGFR is very low. The degree of proteinuria to start with is very low in declare. So we have to, uh, preventive measures to be studied in this trial as compared to canvas and paragin. And when we look at the on the right side, the renal composite endpoints, we can see that when this DEPA 10 milligram is compared with placebo, and uh, after a median follow-up of uh, certain years, we find a significant decline in renal outcome parameters. So it has shown benefits. And the GFR is closer to our case in question, uh, mm -hmm. the baseline GFR in declare. So yeah. it suits in. Yes, sir. And uh, this is a very important finding in this study. There is uh, usually with diabetic nephropathy, there is progression of normal alveolaria to micro to macro alveolaria. With the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in this study, we have found that there was uh, prevention or slowdown or stabilization of progression of proteinuria for normal to micro alveolaria, micro to macro alveolaria, and which was an important finding because proteinuria is an important prognostic factor for pro progression of the chronic kidney disease. And this is regarding the regression. In fact, uh, in significant patient, we found the regression also in the existing proteinuria from the baseline, which decreased from macro to micro to normal. While we come to cardiorenal outcomes, uh, you know, but SGLT2s are not preferred agent for glycemic control. So, you know, clinic benefits on renal, but for glycemic control, we have many options. SGLT is not always the first choice. Your thoughts there, Dr. Kale? Yeah, just before that, I just want to add that, like DECLARE, <coughs> majority of our clinic patients fall into the category of DECLARE trial, which showed a maximum renal benefits, what sir is talking about, and it benefits. Even new onset microalbuminuria is less. Yeah, what your question is, many a times, treating physician is not in the favor of using SGLT2 inhibitors purely for glucose control, because they think there are better drugs. And if you keep cardiorenal things out, there are very few people are using it as a plain, pure, glucose-lowering like agent mm. as we use DPP-4 in. But um, if you see all these, this slide actually shows, according to the baseline A1C, how the like, this is using SGLT2 inhibitor and how dapagliflozin has reduced A1C significantly, even at the baseline of 7.9. So that doesn't make a difference. There is a lot of good reduction. Add on to anything, whatever other anti-diabetic agent, there is a still further reduction. Weight loss, we all, I remember I was a part of very initial phase 3 trials of dapagliflozin way back 20, 
years back and when it sh started showing uh, weight loss, the first time DEXA scan was added as a sub-study mm. and our center was one of that, where it actually showed more fat loss. Mm. And uh, now we know that two-third of weight loss is actually a fat loss <clears throat> and which we just heard in the last talk, how that is important to reduce liver fat, to re have a better prognosis and cardio renal <gasps> liver protection. So this aspect of rapagliflozin or SGLT2 inhibitor should become as the first thing in the mind when we are treating type 2 diabetes in India. The fourth part of the slide shows the blood pressure reduction which is crucial and I think clinically also we all have seen that we reduce antihypertensive when we add a SGLT2 inhibitor and within four to six weeks we need to reduce the antihypertensive medications of these patients not only diuretics but also other because of the good effect on the blood pressure absolutely so, and also it has improves insulin sensitivity mainly because of its effect on the weight and the fat loss and the glycemic control so definitely there is an uh, it improves as we reduce the glucotoxicity it improves as we reduce the weight and fat loss and the point is the weight of the patient. So besides yeah, the A1C, BMI is 30 you wanted Indian to offer Indian, the yeah. weight reduction. Correct. So we know that it's even a, uh, we don't need DEXA, but as a abdominal circumference also goes down significantly with the studies with dapagliflozin, which shows that it, within a six months time, actually you can see the weights, uh, waist circumference going down, which is a measure of central adiposity. So DECLARE was the first trial to have the hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death endpoint as the primary endpoint. Can you provide a brief overview for hospitalization heart failure benefit, Dr. Manoria? DECLARE trial was a trial of patients which we see in our day-to-day -day practice. 60% of patients in the DECLARE trial belong to the primary prevention. 40% belongs to the secondary prevention and we have 20% of patients who had a prior MI. The beauty of DECLARE trial is that when we look at the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, there was a 17% reduction. And this is irrespective of the fact whether you are a secondary prevention group or a primary prevention group. So DAPA is a panacea for decreasing hospitalization for heart failure is a signature effect of SGLT2. Wherever you put SGLT2 inhibitor, it will decrease hospitalization for heart failure, primary prevention, secondary prevention, CKD, or any other subset. The other thing which was noticed is when we look at the atherosclerotic mace, those who are in the primary prevention group, there was no benefit. But those who are in the secondary prevention group, they had suffered from MI, there was a significant decrease in the atherosclerotic mace, giving a message that the mace depends on the subset of patients which you enrolled in the trial. EMPA showed reduction in mace because 100% patients were secondary prevention group. Canvas has less number of secondary prevention and the DAPA has... Uh, Please. Both primary and secondary prevention and secondary prevention go similar. And obviously, the CKD benefit is there. It slows down the trajectory of CKD and postpones dialysis. So it is a benefit effect on the pipes, the filters, and the pump. And for pump, it is a panacea. You can use across the spectrum of heart failure. Okay. Uh, this is the data of 10% of patients in the declared to me who had heart failure. And the results are fantastic. You can see the composite of hospitalization for heart failure and CVD. Uh, the NNT is only 11 substance and for hospitalization for heart failure only 18, CVD at 19, and all cause mortality is only 16. Thereby clearly indicating that if you have a patient of HEF-REF, the benefits are going to be huge. And that we'll see in the DAPA HF trial, which was a dedicated trial for HEF-REF. So the indication was there even in this. And this, of course, you shows uh, that uh, for pump, it is the drug of choice. For filter, as our nephew is the drug of choice. Pipes, it only benefits when you have a secondary prevention group, particularly you already suffered from a prior myocardial infarction. Anushka, 
Yes. As it was saying, only 10%. Actually, all three, Emparek, Declare, and Cre had only 10 to 11% of patients with the low yield. But the rest of them, they yeah. never had pre-existing heart failure. And still, the main primary outcome was decrease in hospitalization for heart failure. So we know that age of diagnosis, obesity, if type 2 diabetes in India, they're more prone for heart failure, though they don't show any signs. And here are the drugs which are making wonders to prevent heart failure in patients who never had anything before. So I think that's a very interesting. That's why SGLT2 inhibitors came. And they're the showing failure. the benefits. Yes, true. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we look at uh, Rakesh, who's 58 years old. Is Rakesh in, in the room? I don't know. Um, diabetic was rushed to an emergency after investigations was diagnosed with an EF of 38%, BMI of 24, A1C 7.2, cholesterol is 190, uh, reduced ejection fraction with EF of 36%, GFR 42, USER 260. Uh, Rakesh is on metformin, CITA, rosuvastatin, metoprolol, ramipril, and he's worried about his heart and the kidney. What would be the line of treatment? In the interest of time, I'll request very quick, crisp answers. We will not be able to wind up between. What would be line of treatment for this acute patient, Dr. Manoria, sir? Uh, this is a classical case of HFREF, who is not destabilized. His blood pressure is normal. He's not on any diuretics or endotropes. So all four drugs can be initiated right at the onset. And the dicta for heart failure these days is, Door to GDMT time and door to maximum GDTM. Just test for acute myocardial infarction and we have door to balloon time. So the current approach is quadruple initiation of all the four drugs. Day one to day four, the earlier you initiate, more is the benefit. And try to achieve the maximum targeted dose prior to hospitalization, but not more than one to four weeks. The earlier you achieve this, the more, because... Uh, uh, 25% uh, of patients who get discharged, one out of four, they get either rehospitalized or they die. And the mortality of ADHF is 10% at one month. So our idea is to initiate therapy at the earliest. And if you look at the projected survival, 65 years, if you start, you can have a life expectancy increase by 6.3 years. So at the same point, if I can ask Dr. Kale. Let's say this patient who has diabetes was on a DPP-4 inhibitor, is admitted once or twice for heart failure, not on an SGLT. HbA1c is fine, not 7.2, but say 6.6. .6. Before discharge, would you consider shifting to an SGLT2 in place of cetagliptin because of the heart failure? Impact? I'll do it on admission, not before discharge. <laughs> on the day one, as we just heard. And if it is first heart failure and he's not on SGLT2, I don't think it will happen in India now because of good CMEs and we all are doing good medical practices. Uh, yes, and question mark about DPP-4 inhibitors, we will not go into that. But first day, we should put him on HGLT-2 inhibitors and he should be there. Thank you. I just... No, this is for Dr. Manoria to tell the new expert proposal for the sequencing of therapies. Although we have this sequence, but our idea is to initiate all four drugs if possible and feasible. In this particular case, it seems very likely we can easily initiate all the four drugs. But in case of difficulty, the first choice falls on SGLT2 inhibitors because it doesn't affect potassium, it doesn't affect uh, EGFR, it doesn't affect blood pressure, it doesn't affect heart rate. So whatever may be the subset of heart failure, SGLT2 inhibitors can be very easily initiated. And so also beta blockers, unless there's severe hypertension. Arni has the problem that... Uh, it can produce substantial reduction in blood pressure and it can also adversely affect EGFR. So the, usually we start with beta blocker and SGLT2 inhibitors which will increase the cardiac output, the renal function will also improve and you can put on RNA and then we can put on AMRA provided the potassium is normal. But quadruple therapy has to be there because each drug provides incremental benefit on top of each other. You start one drug, add another incremental. At third drug incremental and at four. So idea is to have all the four drugs, whatever may be the sequence of initiation, depending on the uh, four factors, the EGFR, the blood pressure, the heart rate, and the potassium levels. And of course, for this patient, if you were to consider ARNI, you would wait for 48 hours as the patient was already See, on Ramipril? With, with uh, uh, 36 hours, of course. She is on Ramipril, so 36 hours we have to wait. That is there. But seems likely all four drugs can be initiated. 
all three right on the day first and remipril maybe after 36 to 48 hours right thank you sir so this is the data and we're going to run through this uh, in the interest of time is it rational to initiate sglt2 in the hospital uh, yes you can see the data on slide if you initiate early the benefit is more if you initiate in hospital the compliance is more the benefit is more as you can see on the slide so early initiation before hospitalization always provides incremental benefit excellent so this patient is a stage 3 ckd how would you tackle it dr saxena's thoughts quickly uh, so this patient um, so beside these starting all these measures ac inhibitors and arbs uh, this is ckd stage 3b now so at this time we have to start sglt2 inhibitors along with metformin because gfr is more than 30 and then we have to monitor the blood pressure and microalmuria and i would like to tell about the depa ckd trial which is a very good trial published in ngm this trial was a randomized control trial 4300 patients recruitment from 2017 and it was a median follow up of 2.4 years 10 mg depa was compared with placebo the good thing which i always highlight in all the talks is that it included patients range in gfr ranging from 25 to 75 ml per hour so mm -hmm. a chunk of patient had gfr in ckd stage 4 so we could get a chance to see the response in the advanced stage of chronic kidney disease also so it has shown a primary composite outcome benefit in 39% it reduces all cause mortality by 31% and composite of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure by 29% Uh, the effect of dapagliflozin on chronic kidney disease was consistent across all categories this trial had one third of the patient in this uh, studies were non diabetic also so the benefit was regardless of the etiology whether patient was diabetic nephropathy or some other ckd and it was also irrespective of the degree of uh, albuminuria so benefit you can see down here there was reduction in all the categories of microalnuria additionally which is not shown in the slide i would like to say that in non diabetic patients population a couple of patient had iga nephropathy also the data is yet to be published but there is certainly definitive uh, there is definitive advantage using sglt2 inhibitors in iga nephropathy and this data is going to be released later on actually i will i will just like okay. to add here uh, that uh, since we are discussing dapagliflozin in february 2023 there is a series of paper published from the investigators of declare and deliver and dapa hf combined pooled analysis and it shows that dapagliflozin is consistent according to the frailty of patient in heart failure age whatever age 70 75 compared to 50 years old whatever is the baseline ejection fraction this has shows consistent effect and there are no sex differences like arni the men and women the differences are same so again as he said consistent effect across all the risk factors all the age groups and according the ejection fraction sure. so i have couple more questions which dr kale i'll pose to both of them can i request you to you have another assignment down yeah. and they are calling so apologies as this was running late but uh, we are okay to excuse you from here so that you can start your session down that's fine if you right. uh, it's yes, they have so called we, yeah, yeah. So okay you, right thank you so let me ask this question to dr saxena about uh, the benefits being a class effect or very specific sir uh, it's very difficult to be answered because unless we have an head to head trial we cannot answer these questions but anyway whatever is uh, data is available from the studies we can say that this dipagliflozin has been studies in uh, in a wider range of uh, gfr so we can answer these questions so as compared to empagliflozin it has shown it is equally good in controlling glycemia but as far as the new onset of diabetes in pre and non diabetic population is concerned it has shown a significant reduction by 32% which empa has not shown it has shown reduction in cardiovascular death hospitalization for heart failure in ckd patients in 29% which is not significant in empa it has shown decrease in all cause mortality in ckd patient with or without diabetes by 30% 1% which is not significant in empa trials and heart failure primary prevention has also been shown significantly in foxeja group as compared to empa so overall we can say this has shown a good benefit as compared to existing drug as far as the trials are showing 
So I think uh, we spoke about the benefits, and I'm in the interest of time. I'm not going into the slides, but a question to both uh, of the experts here: there, there are many generics available. There are branded generics in India. Uh, what one needs to be aware about that the bioequivalence required to to get acceptance for generics is anywhere between 80 to 125 percent. So it's a huge. A range if they show bioequivalence at 80 percent or even 125 percent you get an approval uh, also we know that when we talk about generic drugs um, it is only the bioequivalence that they have to show and not the rest of the data and we are also aware that for a particular drug besides the active ingredient there's a lot of adjuvants there are a lot of mixtures there are a lot of uh, other uh, 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 additions into the drug which may have an impact on the pharmacokinetic profile of the drug. So the question to the experts is, um, there could be excipients in the drugs which may actually impact the, the availability and the variability. Your thoughts on the generic drugs versus innovators from both the experts? I think bioequivalence is mandatory, but if cost is not a problem, uh, we may prefer the uh, original drug. Innovator. Dr. Sakthana, your thoughts? Yeah, similar answer. Uh, as far as when the cost is a concern, then the problem arises. Do nephrologists prefer innovators or generics? For innovators, but when there is a gross difference in the cost of the molecules, we have to make it affordable to the general population also. But if the cost is not much different, you would rather give yeah, the I would innovator prefer this the thing. Origin, yeah. Sure. I think, I think that brings us to the, uh, the, the end of this discussion. Uh, reminding that yes, there is great science in, in, in favor of SGLT2 inhibitors, a lot of benefits seen both in terms of cardiac and, and renal protection, but also reminding that it's not a class effect, you have to look specifically, even if you look at the recommendations from the ADA, it clearly says use of SGLT2 inhibitors and or GLP with proven cardiorenal benefits. So it's not an extension to the entire class, but specific to the molecules that have shown evidence. and. Uh, when you choose your generic drugs, you have to keep in mind the differences in the structure, excipients, purity, and bioavailability as well. So with that, let me thank all the panelists, Dr. Shailaja Kale, whom I had to make a rush to the other room, Dr. Professor Manoria and Dr. Saxena for joining us in this session. Thank you so much for enlightening the crowd.